Cassini Soit de l'autre côté là-bas Soit de l'autre côté là-bas Dans l'or si belle sa vie Un petit peu déraciné Qui peut vivre dans la pauvreté Nous partons à l'identité Un petit peu déraciné Qui peut vivre dans la pauvreté There are times when one tragedy, one crime, tells us how a whole system works behind its democratic facade and helps us understand how much of the world is run for the benefit of the powerful and how governments often justify their actions with lies. The film you're about to see is a shocking, almost incredible story. A government calling itself civilized, tricked and expelled its most vulnerable citizens so that it could give their homeland to a foreign power for a military base. This was all done in high secrecy, and this same government and its successors then watched its citizens starve to death. It watched them despair and take their own lives, while at the same time ministers and their officials mounted a campaign of deception that went all the way up to the Prime Minister. That government was a British government whose policies are continued today. This report is about a faraway people most of you will have never heard of, and yet the lies covering the injustice done to them will be all too familiar. This is Diego Garcia, the main island of the Chagos group in the Indian Ocean. It was once a phenomenon of natural beauty and peace, a paradise. Today it is one of America's biggest military bases in the world. There are more than 2,000 troops, two bomber runways, 30 warships and a satellite spy station. B-1 and B-52 long-range bombers extended their reach from the British base at Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean. From here, the United States has attacked Afghanistan and Iraq. The Pentagon calls it an indispensable platform for policing the world. This will launch right three o'clock. Diego Garcia is a British colony. It lies midway between Africa and Asia, one of a group of unique coral islands. This is rare film taken by missionaries before the Americans came in the 1960s. 2,000 people lived in the Chagos Islands, a gentle Creole population originally from Africa and India whose communities dated back to the late 18th century. They were thriving villages, a school, a hospital, a jail, a church, a railway, and above all, a benign, undisturbed way of life. Si mon grand-mère Bizaïl, pour la naissance de Diego Gracia, mon grand-mère n'est là-bas, mon maman n'est là-bas, moi, mon n'est là-bas, si moi, mon fait à six enfants, Diego, Et dans le monde, qui est plus grand que mon grand-mère Abizaël, qui a eu des enfants là-bas. Le Diego, qui est plus bon souvenir, nous sommes mangés, nous sommes bois. Les amis nous sont pas de nous. Les amis nous sont pas de nous ici, à part de l'Inde, pour nous mettre l'eau. Nous sommes en poule, canard, pop. Je suis à la mer sec. Je suis allé prendre un peu de la mer avec moi. Je suis allé prendre poisson. Je suis allé me devant moi. Unknown to the islanders, all this was about to end. 
a conspiracy was underway between the governments of Britain and the United States. The year is 1961. In this film, never seen before, the man on the right is Rear Admiral Grantham of the US Navy. His visit to Diego Garcia marked the beginning of a top secret Anglo-American survey of the island for a military base so vast that it would cost over a billion dollars. The Chagas Islands were then governed from Mauritius, a thousand miles away. When Mauritius got its independence from Britain in 1968, it was on condition that it would lay no claim to the Chagos Islands. Hidden from Parliament and the US Congress, the deal was this. The Americans wanted the island, in their words, swept and sanitized. An entire population was declared expendable. All of them were to be deported. The British and American authorities implemented a policy decision that was aimed at depriving that community in the Chagos from basic supplies. No milk, no dairy products, no oil, no sugar, no salt, no medication, no more of the things you use in life. The effect of the policy was to terrify many of them into leaving. They were also told their islands might be bombed. In the spring of 1971, Sir Bruce Greatbatch, KCVO, CMG, MBE, governor of the Seychelles, gave the order that all the dogs on Diego Garcia were to be killed. These were much-loved pets, and the horror of their killing was taken as a warning by the islanders. Almost a thousand pets were rounded up and gassed using the exhaust fumes from American military vehicles. Sans être bons enfants là, quand on tente d'être les chiens, quand on peut venir à d'être les chiens, divan d'être d'être pays pleurer, d'être pays crier, c'est là ça grain. I mean, the relationship with our pets should be the same, whether you are Chagosian or whether you are British, and uh, uh, and uh, they they were absolutely destroyed by the fate reserved to their dogs, and and many of them told me. <coughs> In no, in no uncertain words, they were taught that any objection to the depopulation, they would suffer the same fate. Perhaps the lowest trick was that those islanders needing to go to Mauritius were prevented from returning home. Tout mon kit là-bas, mon vini pour venir sur mon bébé, mon retour dans mon endroit. Les temps m'ont allé mal bureau tard. The remaining population were summoned to the administrator's office and told that their homeland had been sold and that those who remained will be loaded onto ships and expelled. In this photograph, people are standing in silence, stunned. Je viens là, il fait une réunion, un air, code bureau, on appelle nous tous, nous pour obliger quitter. Mais ce que tu peux passer là-bas, nous tu connais, pareil comment tu peux faire avec nous les chiens, je tu peux faire ça même à nous, je te sens pitié. They were forced onto this vessel, the SS Nordvær. They were allowed to take only one suitcase. Sir Bruce Greatbatch insisted that the horses took pride of place on deck. The women and children were made to sleep in the hold on a cargo of bird fertilizer, bird shit.
Batou la nous da Ensel Matla. Quand tu tes enfants qui ont dit mon nom, ils ont été Ensel Matla. Nous même qui tu es en animaux. Nous même dans sa gauche, hein? femmes, enfants, nous qui tu es en animaux, nous nous devons. The first port of call was the Seychelles, where they were herded from the boat. This is a rusting monument to their agony. From here they were marched up the hill to a prison that has since been demolished. They were kept in cells until they were transported to Mauritius. This is Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius. Here they were dumped on the docks, bewildered and terrified. Some of them stayed on the, on the docks, waiting for the next ship to take them back home, you see. And uh, there was never to be a, a ship to take them back home. They were taken to this housing estate, which was then derelict and had been taken over by animals. It was hell. I went to see them. Literally hell. What way was it hell, do you think? It, it was uh, it's the, the filth. No water in those houses and uh, no sanitation. Oh, it was really... And the children, they had no clothes, the children were absolutely, you know, as if they'd been rolled over in ash and earth and... And then when it rained, it was, you know, water everywhere. The islanders began to die, not only from poverty, but from what they call sadness. Lizette, now in her 60s, lost two children. Mais, les enfants sont extra grands parce qu'il y a un petit bois avec moi. Les temps, moi, mon gars, ça nous fait la moindre de ça grand. La tristesse d'une bois, elle dit les ça grand, ça l'autre enfant là, il est tenu à 8 ans. Il n'a pas ça grand, il ne connaît qu'à depuis là-bas. Tout ce qui peut causer, tout ce qui peut passer, peut quitter ce pays, il est resté sans ça grand. They would sing their way through life. Here, I mean, they, they, they wept their way through life, and they're still weeping, you see. And there were, as you mentioned, so many cases of suicides. But there were so many cases of children, you know, not receiving proper care and dying in hospital. I know the case of one lady who lost two children within two or three months, and he, she wasn't able even to, uh, uh, to, 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 to perform the funerals of, of her child because she didn't have the money necessary for that. And it was the state who took care of it. The hospital, from the hospital, the child was taken to the cemetery, you see. Do you realize what sort of a trauma, what sort of, of experience this is for, for an old lady? And this old lady is still weeping to be able to go back home. By the end of 1975, the secret expulsion of the people of the Chagos Islands was complete. A survey of their conditions in exile told of 26 families that had died together in poverty, of nine suicides, of young girls forced into prostitution in order to survive. The report gave these examples. Elaine and Michelle Musa, mother and child, committed suicide. Leone Rangasamy, prevented from going back, drowned herself. Tarine Chateau, no job, no roof, committed suicide. This was a glimpse of the suffering inflicted by the British government. And yet, in a letter dated 16th of August, 1976, a Foreign Office official wrote, and I quote, although we have no information about deaths, some deaths are bound to have occurred 
in the normal course of events. This is how most British people know Mauritius, as an exotic holiday destination, especially for honeymooners. They almost never see the slums of the exiled people of the Chagos, who are also British citizens. This is film taken in 1982 of a family of Chagos Islanders in exile in Mauritius. Here all 25 of them sleep in shifts in one squalid room with the baby in a cardboard box. We found the same family living in the same shack in the same terrible conditions. They still sleep on the floor. The rain still pours in. The toilet is still a hole in the ground. They are still so poor that they often go hungry. What was done to these people is today defined in international law as a crime against humanity. What has changed since they were last filmed 22 years ago? Your wife, she, she died, is that right? Yes, she yeah. died. It's not nostalgia, it's more than that. It's like um, missing even the air that you breathe, missing the environment that you're used to, missing your home, missing your cats and your dogs, and your pets, which were all destroyed. This is Olivia Bancourt, leader of the Chagos Islanders in exile. When he was a boy, he promised his mother, Rita, that he would lead the fight for justice for his people. Olivia knows all too well their suffering. So you've lost a sister and three, four brothers? Four brothers, yeah. Tell me what happened to them. I have a, a, one brother who had died with uh, uh, hard drugs. I have two bro other brothers who died with uh, alcohol. My, my sister just put a fire on, on her. She had been very discouraged with the life. She committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, suicide, yeah. In 1982, the Chagos Islanders, now desperate, demonstrated in the streets of Mauritius. This embarrassed the British government into giving them a derisory compensation, which came to less than 3,000 pounds per person. This didn't even pay their debts. And to get this money, many believe they were tricked into signing away their right to return home. It was entirely 
improper, unethical, dictatorial to have the Shagosian put the thumbprint on an English legal drafted document where the Shagosian, who doesn't read nor speak any English, let alone legal English, is made to renounce basically all his rights as a human being. Renouncing their rights was precisely what the British government wanted them to do. They could then be forgotten. That same year, the government spent two billion pounds defending the rights of the Falkland Islanders, who are white. My people, the Queen would say in a Christmas broadcast, so you send them 2,000 uh, 2, inhabitants of the Falklands, and you've got 2,000 people of Jagos, one out, the other one, we come to your rescue, come on. Come on, you are, you are all English, you're all British. <laughs> Come on. What's the difference? Where's your sense of fair play, my fellas? <laughs> Where's your sense of fair play? Mm -hmm. That could be a breakthrough. Yeah, of course. From a tiny lockup in the poorest section of Port Louis, Mauritius, Olivia Bancor, an electrician, has taken the struggle across the world. And here you're with Nelson Mandela. Yeah, I I am with Nelson Mandela, an example of, of, of human rights fighter, you see. Uh, we compare our struggle to the struggle of Nelson Mandela who had been... In the 1990s, the islanders' struggle took a dramatic turn with the discovery of these documents in the public record office in London. Here was the evidence that they and their supporters were looking for. These long-forgotten secret official files revealed the full scale of the conspiracy and the cynicism that drove it. The conspiracy got underway with the creation of a fake colony called the British Indian Ocean Territory, or BIOT. The sole purpose of creating this colony was to kick the people out. And to do it, the Foreign Office invented a fiction. They said the islanders didn't really belong to the Chagos, but were merely temporary contract workers. Foreign Office Memorandum, July 1965. People were born there, and in some cases their parents were born there too. The intention is, however, that none of them should be regarded as being permanent inhabitants of the islands. So how would they be regarded? The legal position of the inhabitants would be greatly simplified from our point of view, though not necessarily from theirs, if we decided to treat them as a floating population. This long-forgotten British government film shot in 1957 reveals the duplicity. Clearly, the Foreign Office knew the people of the Chagos were anything but temporary workers. Out of a total of 100 or more little islands, only some half a dozen are permanently inhabited, partly by people from Mauritius and the Seychelles, but mostly by men and women who have been born and brought up on these fragments of land. It is the story of their lives which this film tells. The British tried to claim, and I, I just quote one of their documents, that the Chagos had no indigenous or settled population. Marchi, Zame. Mon papa n'est là-bas, mon grand-père n'est là-bas, mon grand-mère n'est là-bas, mon maman n'est là-bas. Cause Marchi. Il manchi, génération, est là-bas. Back in London, some officials began to worry about being caught out. Foreign Office Memo, November 1965. 
There is a civilian population. In practice, however, I would advise a policy of quiet disregard. In other words, let's forget about this one until the United Nations challenges on it. One can only say that they were looking at another prize and this was considered a, a, a price that was worth paying because in reality there would be no objections and they would get away with it. And all they were concerned about, the documents show this quite clearly, all they were concerned about was whether they'd be found out. In that same month, the British representative at the United Nations, F.W.D. Brown, was instructed to lie to the General Assembly that the Chagos Islands were uninhabited when the United Kingdom first acquired them. I must remind you that this has been done in violation of the United Nations Charter. This is why it was done so uh, in absolute discretion and using lies. I'm not minting my words. They were lies, damn lies. What the official documents show is not just a trail of lies, but an imperious attitude of brutality and contempt. In August of 1966, Sir Paul Gore Booth wrote, We must surely be very tough about this. The object of the exercise was to get some rocks which will remain ours. There will be no indigenous population except seagulls. At the end of this, is a note handwritten by Dennis Greenhill, later Baron Greenhill of Harrow. Unfortunately, along with the birds go some few Tarzans or Men Fridays, whose origins are obscure, and who are being hopefully wished on to Mauritius, etc. When you look at the documents, here you've got some of your former colleagues talking about, well, we just need some rocks because in all that's on it are a bunch of Tarzans and a few Janes and, and all that. Uh, well, yes. I mean, I, I, I know the person that you're referring to and the, and the uh, minute that you're referring to. Yeah. Uh, and I have the greatest respect for him. He's, he's dead now. Uh, and I'm sure that if he had any clue that, that his throwaway remarks would have become public, he would never have written that. Uh, because I don't believe he's that sort of person, frankly. Uh, you know, people, people put things in minutes on, on official papers that they don't really mean. The conspirators now began to get the wind up. A senior official wrote, This is really all fairly unsatisfactory. We propose to certify up to 240 islanders, more or less fraudulently, as belonging somewhere else. This all seems difficult to reconcile with the sacred trust of the United Nations Charter. The sacred trust he refers to obliges Britain to safeguard the human rights of its citizens in a dependent territory. His warning counted for little. One official offered a way round the problem. He wrote, yes, yes, I've got it right in front of We do not regard the United Kingdom as bound by such a rule. In this respect, we are able to make up the rules as we go along and treat the inhabitants of BIOT as not belonging to it in any sense. This same official summed up the whole charade in the subtitle of one of his reports, Maintaining the Fiction. Do you think they were aware of what they were doing to the people, that the trauma that was about to descend on the Chagossians? These boys in the colonial office, did they really care very much about... <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, you know, you had your standard of living, you kept to it. Yeah, your pink gin at lunchtime, and yeah. <laughs> so they were just the natives. The, the natives, yes. Um, unfortunately, the cover-up went right to the top of government, 
It was drawn up by the Foreign Secretary, Michael Stewart, in the form of a secret minute sent to the Prime Minister on July the 25th, 1968. In this document, Stewart reveals that he is fully aware that Diego Garcia has a population going back at least two generations. He proposes that the government lie to the world that there is no indigenous population. On April the 26th, 1969, Wilson's private secretary wrote to Stewart saying that the Prime Minister approved the plan. The documents show that it was decided at the highest level by the Prime Minister, most particularly Harold Wilson. He knew very well that there was a population and they were going to be removed. The problem is that this is policy made almost on the back of an envelope. There's no democratic input. Uh, nobody was asking questions, nobody was knocking on the door, nobody was there to represent the interest of the islanders. They just didn't exist as a political factor to take into account. Dennis Healy was defence secretary in the same government. When we asked Mr Healy for an interview, he replied, I fear I have no memories of the Chagos archipelago. Sorry. Lord Healy's uh, a letter about not remembering the Chagos archipelago. Bollocks. Absolutely. Mm. He's a, an acute and intelligent man. On May the 6th, 1969, Healy's private secretary wrote this letter to 10 Downing Street. It confirmed that the defense secretary had read Stuart's plan and agrees with its recommendations. In Washington, a parallel conspiracy was taking place, also in high secrecy. The object was to keep the expulsion of the islanders from Congress. So payment for the lease of the islands was disguised as a $14 million discount on a Polaris nuclear missile about to be supplied to the Royal Navy. Is there ever a time when people in power consider the consequences of the imposition of that power? Because the consequences for the population of Diego Garcia were disastrous. The circumstances involved how many? Uh, 2,000 people. 2,000 people. Who'd been living there since the end of the 18th century. Well, a fair number of them, if I remember, were, were uh, external laborers. Well, been that, that, that's been shown to be untrue. The British government tried to represent them as that. They were an indigenous six, that, four, three, four generations. As I said, I went through this record some years ago, mm. and at that time, it was said that these were imported laborers to some degree. We found in the National Archives in Washington this letter from the American ambassador in Mauritius. February the 1st, 1972, Ambassador Brewer to Washington. It is, of course, absurd to imply that Diego Garcia had no fixed population. There is no question that the island has been inhabited since the 18th century. I don't think there's any doubt at all that the Americans who visited the islands to reconnoitre as to whether this was a suitable base area, they saw that there was a functioning civilization on the island. They could not have been unaware of the settled human communities that they found. So when Schlesinger said they didn't know, they'd looked into it, that just... No, amnesia at best. That's all you can say to that. It was not true. They knew. There's another... And they collaborated together on how do we get rid of these people? How do we lie uh, that they're simply contract laborers? When many of them, their fathers, their grandfathers, perhaps even further back, were in the cemetery. If you take a decision in Washington and London and it devastates the lives of several thousand people on the other side of the world, isn't that something that should be called to account, no matter how long? 
amongst the various activities of the British and the American government in the 20th century, not to mention the 19th century, this was a relatively small matter. If one goes back to British behavior, for example, in World War II, uh, the attack on Dresden, uh, the attack on the French fleet, all under Winston Churchill, whom we so much admire, and rightly so, this is a very small matter. It is being pinpointed now for reasons uh, that I cannot ascribe to anything other than the quest for a certain publicity. Well, I think it's a, from their point of view, for one thing, the Chagossian Islanders are not the, the Nazis, and from their point of view, it's a quest for justice. And what is your motivation, if I may inquire? Purely the quest for justice, I'm sure. Yes. Yes, of yes course. Yes, it is. Yes. Do you not think these, these questions are, are valid in asking you about consequences of the imposition of great power on peoples? I think that the questions uh, refuse, are based upon a refusal to acknowledge the context of the times and the attitudes of the times and that is based upon uh, a willingness 35 or 40 years after a set of events to go back and critique them uh, when they had uh, become, what shall I say, far less relevant. Far less relevant? The High Court in London found it extremely relevant. In November 2000, it agreed with the people of the Chagos and handed down a shaming rebuke to the British government. The court ruled that the expulsion of the islanders was illegal. After more than 30 years, they had won and were finally going home, or so they believed. Uh, the day Victory in the High Court gave Olivia Bancourt and his people the right to start their lives again. It's something which I will never forget. When just coming out of the court with this to ask that it is a victory for, for the Sagotian people, a small people upon a big power. However, the Foreign Office had other ideas. Within hours of the High Court judgment, it announced that the government would not allow the islanders back to Diego Garcia, the main island where most of them came from. Robin Cook told me that he said it would have been politically impossible to allow the Chagossians to go back to Diego Garcia because they had a treaty with the United States. Well, the first thing to point out there is that this is British sovereign territory. The British have a duty to their own citizens. They have the legal power to tell the Americans uh, what policy and what immigration law they're putting in place on the islands. But in the meantime, we've signed a couple of pieces of paper with the Americans, and we now regard our obligations to them as uh, paramount. Uh, I just don't see the logic of that. And to keep the people from the rest of the Chagos Islands, the Foreign Office invokes something called a feasibility study, which would question if people could survive in this idyllic place where they had lived for six generations. This study consulted not a single inhabitant of the Chagos Islands. 
After the High Court victory, the government promised the islanders that at least they could visit the graves of their families. Boats were chartered here in Port Louis, Mauritius, but they never set sail. Baroness Amos, Tony Blair's leader of the House of Lords, explains why they never went back. We chartered a vessel. Unfortunately, uh, the vessel was not made available. Uh, we are happy to reinstate any such visit, but it would not include Diego Garcia uh, because of the reluctance of the US government. The president of Mauritius, Kasamu Team, took her up on this. So I said to the Baroness, I said, Britain has no objection. She said, no, Britain has not. She said, do you allow me to take the matter up with President Bush? She said, by all means. And this is what I did. I wrote to President Bush. The reply came, I'm sorry to say, we don't deal with the Mauritian government. We deal only with the British government. And the British are not agreeable. It's black and white. The British are not agreeable to this visit. And we agree with the British. So they've been playing table tennis, ping pong, with the Shagosians. When we go to London, we are told it's an American problem. When we go to Washington, we are told it's a London problem. It is an arrangement between them to, to you know, treat this problem as a ping pong ball. And, and, and it's, it's terrible because by the time the ping pong game is over, well, there will be no Shagosians left. By June this year, the Blair government had run out of excuses, but there was still one more trick to play. Have you ever heard of something called an order in council? It's a royal decree using archaic powers, which unknown to most of us are still invested in the Queen. It's a cozy arrangement. The Queen rubber stamps what in many cases, politicians know they can't get away with democratically. On November the 5th, 1965, an order in council was issued by the government of Harold Wilson. The aim was to secretly expel the population of the Chagos Islands, all of them loyal subjects of the Queen. In June this year, the Blair government used the same powers to bypass Parliament and the High Court in order to ban the Chagos Islanders from ever returning home. Dictators do this but without the quaint ritual. The quaint ritual takes place here at Buckingham Palace. The public never sees it. Parliament is merely told about it. Orders in council, uh, they go through without discussion. They're read in title only. No reason is given for them. No contents are spoken. The Privy Council never even sits down. They all stand around. The clerk to the council reads the thing in title. Uh, there were two orders, and the Queen says, agreed. And that's it. That is it. It's a decree. It's a decree. And with that royal decree, the people were banned forever from going home. It was June the 10th, 2004, election day in Britain, when they thought no one would notice. The High Court has ruled that the expulsion of the Chagossians was illegal. The uh, Commission on Human Rights at the United Nations has called on your government to uh, return them to their homeland. Why has this government denied this basic human right of return? Firstly, the feasibility study, which was drawn up by independent experts, which told us that the only population of the islands that would be possible is short term on a subsistence basis. Longer term would be precarious given the climactic conditions, given that in some cases uh, some of the islands are barely two foot above sea level and would be very costly. It is true that the Foreign Office has conducted I think now three um, feasibility studies as they call them about resettlement. Their contents have nothing whatever to do with the resettlement of the islanders who had lived there for 200 years. Page after page after page is devoted to establishing that the beaches are made of sand. Take your shoes and socks off and walk across them. You know what sand is, I know what sand is. 
They then go on to say human interaction on global warming will make occupation of the islands precarious for a resettled population. But that's a very strange statement because there is a settled population. There's hundreds of American military and thousands of civilian workers. They're all on Diego Garcia. They're not going to sink under the waves. Far from sinking, they're sailing on it, swimming in it, playing in it, and having a barbie next to it. And what do they call this unlivable place? Fantasy Island. Nobody takes those conclusions seriously, and, and, and insofar as the government repeats them, I'm afraid they, they're just opening themselves up to ridicule. At the moment, on Diego Garcia, there are 4,000 US servicemen and contractors. There are two bomber runways, each two and a half miles long. There are anchor anchorages for 30 ships and two nuclear-cleared berths. There are space tracking domes and weapon rages. It's the biggest American base outside the United States, which the US Navy describes as indispensable. The living conditions as outstanding. The recreational facilities as unbelievable. And the US wants to extend the lease past 2016. And, and, and you're asking us to believe these islands are uninhabited or they're sinking? No, no, no. Of course they're inhabitable, but at a cost. The United States does have concerns about the climactic conditions longer term in respect of Diego what Garcia. And has uh, exactly the same concerns that were formulated in our uh, independent study. But what the independent study told me, there was, there, there was no fresh drinking water, there was you know, real concerns in the outer islands about the sea levels and the danger of flooding, and there would be a need for substantial expenditure on actually building a livable uh, infrastructure. One of the chief things was, what is the water supply going to be like? Oh my God, we can't guarantee it. These islands, and I published this in 1971, are respectively uh, the third, Peros Banhas, and the fifth, Salomon, wettest islands in the world. Peros with four meters of rain a, a, a year, and the other with 3.5. When it rains, the water table is so high, um, the rain remains on the surface for days. So, so what, what does that make, these feasibility studies? Worthless. Waste of time. Waste of time. Let me ask you, does this government, do politicians in this government, because this story has shocked most people, mm. do you not feel any shame for these actions? I've said to you at the beginning, I am not seeking to justify the decisions no, that now. were taken in the I 60s mean, and 70s. No, I mean shame now, because no, you no, no, no. the, same, no, the same powers to ban them. No, I don't feel ashamed, because I took what I believe, and the government took, a responsible decision in the circumstances, almost 40 years after the last Chargossian lived within these islands, and I was being asked, and the government and the British taxpayer was being asked, to pick up the financial tab to allow, uh, almost on an exploratory basis, for people to go back to the islands. You, you, you can't manufacture money. You actually have to make choices about how you spend your money. Only the other day, the minister was asked, uh, by a member of parliament, what is the anticipated cost? Mm. And uh, the answer was five million pounds to set up and five million pounds a year to run. Well, that's peanuts. Five million pounds is the cost of a, uh, an embassy building in London. This is an embassy building in Mauritius, home to Mr. David Snoxall, the British High Commissioner. It has tennis courts, lavish gardens, security fences, a swimming pool, and a Jaguar car. All paid for by the British taxpayer. Minutes away, these are the British citizens who are less worthy of taxpayers' money. The reason the government won't allow the islanders to go home is not money, it's power, American power, and its self-given role to dominate. Might is right, and the great powers have the might, and therefore the right to do anything they want, wherever and whenever they want. They wanted the Chagossian Islands, in particular Diego Garcia, for a base. They take it, 
they grab it. It's their right. However, the islanders are not giving up their right of return. Today they're getting ready to demonstrate outside the British High Commission in Port Louis. So these are all going on the demonstration to yeah. the High Commission? Yeah, of course. This, uh, this is a, a, a particularly <coughs> uh, relevant one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. When you, I mean, that's quite a serious indictment. What, 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 yeah, of course. We but should, you're referring to we the, high, the High Court yeah. found in your favour that you could all go home yeah. and the British government has prevented you from yeah, going yeah. home. Yeah, yeah. This is this why we, it, 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 it's true. It's something that not everyone must know about it. What the British government seems to be using all of its powers to even capture the, uh, the law and using it for its own political ends. You know, by overturning the High Court ruling and saying that you know, this is no longer on, that our, by referring to the Crown prerogative and going back to these medieval laws and overturning you know, the legal decision to allow these people back to the outlying islands, that to me is a capture of the legal powers of the state that really only happens in totalitarian regimes. The struggle and the dignity of the Chagos Islanders were displayed here by elderly ladies having to stand on the street and shout for their basic human rights. You know, these are a lot of very spirited old ladies who you won't allow to go home where they want to go home and die. That's basically, these are the people who are leading the charge among the Chagossians. Isn't that shameful? Of course I've got sympathy for people based upon what happened to them and their families in the past. But this is today, almost 40 years after that event. And for us and the British government and the British taxpayer to be asked to finance that, when that money could actually alternatively go on leaving aid uh, and, and, and poor people throughout the world, but that, that is a choice, that, that you ask me whether I'm ashamed of the decision that I've taken. No, I'm not. I believe in the circumstances, and it was a difficult decision. I believe we took the right decision. No human being would treat another human being the way the British administration treated the Shagosian people. In this part of the world, except if we go back to the days of slavery and to the days of endangered labor mm. we don't we, we i can't remember anything of the sort happening jesus christ how low can you get how how intellectually dishonest how morally duplicitous can you get I, i've spent my life 40 years now with this and every single thing sickens me sickens me and it goes on it goes on it goes on conservative labor year after year olivier and rita lizette and charlesia come to this monument in port lewis harbor it commemorates those chagos islanders who died in exile from sadness Il bien ça rien, il bien faire les guerres faire mal. Et bon Dieu pour punir les autres ça, ça quand tes matières qu'ils ont préféré nous souffrir. Nous bien si bien madame, on dit là. Bien si bien. Scalé en coussier. Dites moi là tout mon arrivé. Hein Vous faites dire où tu allais là Ça ça me disait. Et tous les temps qui me là, me la vie quand mon masque pas de mon politique. Mon pas pris de lui. Parce qu'à coup de bon Dieu ramasse moi. The film you've just seen is not only the story of a single injustice, it's a rare glimpse of great power at its most ruthless. What was done to the people of the Chagos raises wider questions for those of us who live in powerful states like Britain and America. Why do we continue to allow our governments to treat people in small countries 
as either useful or expendable, why do we accept specious reasons for the unacceptable? Four years ago, the High Court delivered one of the most damning indictments of a British government. It said the secret expulsion of the Chagos Islanders was wrong. That judgment must be upheld, and the people of a group of beautiful, once peaceful islands must be helped to go home and compensated fully and without delay for their suffering. Anything less diminishes the rest of us.